Good evening and welcome. My name is Nick Keep. I'm the Dean of the School of Science and I'm standing in for my colleague Miriam Zukas, who normally introduces B. Birkbeck events. It's my great pleasure to welcome to this fourth B. Birkbeck lecture on change and the start of Law Week, which runs for the entire week with a whole series of events. So in a moment I'll introduce tonight's speakers, but first I'm going to tell you a bit about B. Birkbeck, although you probably know more about it than I do. So B. Birkbeck's inspiration comes from our Royal Charter, which says Birkbeck exists to promote for the public benefit and to provide for persons who are <coughs> engaged in earning their livelihood during daytime and other persons, education, instruction and means for research and such facilities as may be deemed appropriate. If you notice, it says nothing in there about qualifications and exams, and Birkbeck is more, about more than just qualifications and <coughs> exams. It's about ex extending knowledge to the public in general, and that's part of what B. Birkbeck does. Our members are part of a unique research intensive evening university. We lay on special members' lectures and events, we have podcasts available for you, the films, exhibitions, lectures, and worships. So the workshops. So the advantages of B. Birkbeck are great. So B. Birkbeck is open to everyone. So if you're here with your at all week hat on, do join B. Birkbeck and get access to our events. So if you'd like further information about B. Birkbeck, th these ladies here on the front row can give you plenty of information at the end. So what we're really here for tonight is to discuss change as crisis. And Pro professor Michelle Everson, who is a professor of law in the School of Law, specialising in European law, and she's going to be talking about her view of where we are and the very topical subject of the European Union. Obviously, there's barely a fortnight to go before we all get to make up our minds possibly irrevocably on the European Union. So Michelle is an expert on European regulatory law, European administrative law, and constitutional law, and citizenship. And economic law. <laughs> and economic law, excellent. It's all the same thing. She's worked at the <laughs> European University Institute in Florence and at the University of Bremen. She's advised the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the European Central Bank. Unsuccessfully. <laughs> Didn't take the blindest bit of notice of me. And she's published <laughs> many books on... Not many books. ...making not many books. the EU Constitution <laughs> and Trade, Health and the Environment, the European Union put to the test. So, Michelle will shortly give her lecture on Europe at the crossroads, changing its crisis, and there will be an extended time for questions and answers at the end or question discussion, and I guess we don't always have the, the answers. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Michelle to give this evening's Be Birkbeck lecture. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Nick. Tonight, I mean, we actually... Um, we, we trailed this lecture as, as me being quite neutral and just explaining to you why the European Union is in crisis at the moment. I mean, the European Union in its many incarnations has been through so many changes, so many changes from a, an economic community to a political community, the enlargement, and to date these changes have followed without a crisis. But this time around, it's not just Brexit, it is sovereign debt crisis, it's financial crisis, and it is migration crisis, and various other... The UK is not alone in doubting the European Union. Throughout Europe, uh, populaces are beginning to ask, you know, what is this beast, the European Union, and is it necessarily in our best interest? So today was supposed to be a sort of fairly neutral, not for or against uh, um, uh, the UK in Europe. Um, but I must admit, in writing my piece, I eventually came down on the foreside uh, those of you who've seen me teach before will know that that wasn't actually a foregone conclusion. I am pro-Europe, but very disappointed uh, with the current state of the European Union. I have never nevertheless come down with an argument for Europe for you tonight. But to give you balance, this is an old friend of mine, 
Lord Morris Glasman. He uses much the same material. We've been having this conversation for 25 years, and he comes to completely the opposite conclusion, like, you got it all wrong, Shell. You got it all wrong. And I think he probably will be publishing something on this over the next couple of weeks. So if you want the same material but the different view, watch out for Morris. Okay, now just to give you a quick overview about what I'm going to do, I'm going to posit an ideal European Union, not facts, an ideal. I'm going to then go through malaise in Europe, the historical malaise. Europe as a destructive force, explaining that. Then also talk about the current crisis as a very German crisis, that Germany is the European problem. But then I'll go on and give you an alternative view that this is not really a European problem at all. This is a global problem. And it's not a crisis of Europe. It's a crisis of economic liberalism. I'll explain that as we go on. And then I'm going to propose, very German, more order, less Europe as a solution to our current problem. And believe me, it is, more, it is very German. You'll see as we go along just how German this gets. And then a final paradox, because there is something, there is always going to be something very wrong with the European project, in that European universalism always closes itself. We end up with fortress Europe, which is simply a paradox we can't get over. But to kick off, who's facts? The debate so far around Brexit has been facts, simple facts fighting over facts, and the truth of the matter is that you can't do a cost-benefit analysis of the European Union. It is far too complex. Um, uh, the measures that create a single market are also about changing the way we live, and that is not going to show up in any form of economic figure. So the fact-based debate, which has also been quite simply mendacious, yeah, in a certain sense, well, in a very real sense, doesn't really tell us much about the European Union, why, sh why we should stay in it. We should be looking more to the ideals of why we should stay in it. But therein lies our first problem, the primary ideal with which people worked at the very beginning of the European Union was the never again, that we don't want to break the peace of Europe. But how many of us now are directly connected to the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Very few of us. I don't think young people as such are really going to have that core emotional belief in Europe that people who lived through the Second World War did. So that's not really the ideal that would be suitable to today, nor, in a certain sense, is the federalist dream of Europe. Um, I've been around Europe many times over, mostly with Ryanair, at least in the recent past. And uh, the only Federalists I have ever met have been members of the Federalist Party. Yeah? The average European is not a Federalist. We still remain very much located in our local, regional, national uh, context. So a federal Europe is also not the dream. What or the ideal. Now, what is insistent and what is not spoken about is that we are in a global world and we are in a global economy. And this is the insistent problem. Sorry, I, I was trying out the new functions on the PowerPoint. I don't know if it works very well. It's quite good, but maybe not that. Fair. But anyway, yeah, this is the problem that is claiming our attention. We have a global state of economic nature. This is what globalisation is about. And we ought to be asking ourselves with relation to the UK and to Europe, what is our place within this process of globalisation? What is, yeah, what is, what should our place within globalisation be? And for me, <sighs> Europe, for all that it fails, for all that it fails quite dreadfully, has always been the template for post-national organisation. The set of institutions that try, maybe not successfully, but try to impose order upon cross-border markets, across, upon cross-border economies. So for me, surely the ideal of Europe and why we should invest in it normatively 
normatively, our belief is that it can still act as the template for order in chaos, the set of institutions that can impose justice on a global economic world. Okay? So that would be the ideal. Now, what's the problem now? Integration as disintegration. Europe at the moment is utterly complicit in the state of market nature, in the unrestrained economic liberalisation that is also a character of globalisation. Europe is not a bulwark against it. Europe is absolutely complicit in it. A very convincing argument says this happened because of 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And this was an utterly unexpected geopolitical earthquake. And suddenly we had the imperative, and it was an imperative, to integrate Eastern Europe within the European Union. This is sometimes something that's, that's forgotten in the meantime, but the fight for the soul of Eastern Europe was very much, um, very much expressed in, in, in European Union expansion, not just to secure Eastern Europe against Russian influences, but also to secure Eastern Europe against American influences. There was a bit of a battle going on at the time. Now, I worked on one of the Commission's um, uh, uh, working groups for Eastern Enlargement, actually on how the acquis communitaire, we call it, so how European laws could be brought to Eastern Europe. And ultimately, what happened was, in, in contrast to previous succession arrangements, so when Portugal joined or Spain joined, there was a negotiation period and we negotiated how much of European Union law they should take over when. They'd already become members, and they still had a transition period before they had to take on our market law. Now they had a transition <coughs> period. In relation to Eastern Europe, no, they had to take on our economic law, the whole body of economic law, before they could even begin to negotiate with us. Now, in that working group, when I looked at that, and I thought, well, hang on, Hang on, guys, it's a working group of EU functionaries and, and academics. We've, we, you know, these are newly liberated nations, and to secure their liberation, we're going to dump, in a very colonial manner, we're going to dump a European uh, rule book on them. And my high pitched at the time, I was actually, look, I, I didn't look like that then. <laughs> That's a bit later. I was still a bit of a hippie, still had, still had very long black hair at the time. But... When just in the middle of the meeting, I just screeched out, well, why can't we give them a Marshall Plan? Now, the answer from Horst Krenzler, who was also uh, one of the founding commissioners, this gentleman on the right, he also didn't look like that then, he looked a bit older, uh, was, young lady, I have been patronised by the very best of them in my time, and this was, was a good one. Young lady, nobody's going to pay for it. Nobody's go going to pay for it. Um, well, I, I don't remember anyone asking the peoples of Europe if we wanted to pay for it, but the governments decided that no one was going to pay for Eastern enlargement. So from that, we ended up with our modern scenario that Eastern Europe must compete itself to parity with Western Europe, must make, must make use of its competitive labour advantage in the jargon. Okay? Because you can do things cheaper, you will somehow come up to our equilibrium. Now, the flip side of that, of course, is the pressure on Western European social settlements, the pressure on Western European wage rates, the pressure on welfare. This is a downward spiral for Western Europe. It's quite a tricky issue, but that's, that's the first liberalising, economically rampant consequence of 1989. Also, though, the price for German reunification. Germany did not want the euro, did not want the euro, did not want to end up in a common currency with the French. But the price for reunification was joining the euro with consequences that we'll see subsequently. Also, though, Germany joining the euro 
at an interest rate that was not suitable to Germany's economy of the 1990s, and above all, not suitable to Germany's economy following reunification, turned Germany into the sick man of Europe. And Germany reacted in, well, in a vicious way, in a certain sense for us. In the early 2000s, its welfare reform, Hartz IV, reduced German welfare uh, payments, also reduced German wages, also reduced German wages, which has had some quite bad consequences for the rest of us. Germany also applied a debt break, the first debt break, the first commitment of a European government to austerity happens in the 2000s in Germany. So as a result of this, and this will be the major argument, as a result of 1989, the geopolitical earthquake, the eastward enlargement of the EU, we have a move within Europe away from its quite benign socially democratic construction to a form of economic liberalism predicated in market solutions and less government expenditure. That would be the sort of argument you hear about why the Europe of today looks so vicious, is, especially if you're Greek. Okay? If truth be told, though, the process of... Europe surrendering to a market solution, to competitive markets, to efficiency thinking, to the dominant ra economic rationality that we have today, began in the 1980s. And it began in integration as disintegration. Now, this movement, as we see the two, bless them, <laughs> the two on the right here, Ronald Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher. This was a national movement. This was a change in national economic philosophies. Also political organisation around national economic philosophies. Market liberalisation in the UK wasn't just about market liberalisation. It was about a revolution in society that people would become economically self-sufficient rather than rely on the, on the state. With that change in national thinking, the whole integration process at European Union level changed and changed irrevocably. From This is the, another thing about the Brexit debate and a, a misconception, national sovereignty, the loss of national sovereignty in Europe. The Court of Justice had created its own doctrine of European supremacy, which limited explicitly in the court of the European Court of Justice's words, national sovereignty, way back when in the 1960s. Up until the 1980s, the impacts of that were not felt at all. It was not particularly relevant. You only begin to feel the impact of a loss of national sovereignty as market integration at European Union level changes from the idea of we will harmonise all of our national markets into one of we will force the creation of a single European market using, using efficiency logics, using efficiency logics, saying, look, the way you regulate, the way you regulate consumer protection is simply inefficient. We will knock down that protection and we will re-regulate as well, but in an, an efficient mode. What I noticed in my study of the time, and I was studying finance markets uh, in the UK and Germany in the 1980s, and I was quite naive about it. This was PhD study, and I wasn't particularly setting out to prove anything. I was sat in archives with uh, uh, well, dusty archives from insurance companies reading these sort of ancient tomes that Fred from accounts wrote after 50 years of service to Sun Alliance to try and get the history of, of what was going on. And I, I, I found that you, you can never say 
that a regulatory scheme, a way of doing things, is neutral in any way, shape or form. The form of regulation you have in a market, and very, very relevant in terms of um, um, finance markets, reflects national culture, national economic policy, national politics. In Germany, you had a neo-corporatist uh, model of regulation around finan finance markets that was to do with securing inward investment into the German economy. They didn't want internationalized banks or insurers. They wanted them locally placed and locally responsive to investment needs within Germany. And that was maintained by a really tight web of government or labor uh, producer and consumer interests that have been speaking to each other for X number of years. So integration disembedded national economies from those complexes. If you're talking about a market, just simply in terms of markets are efficient, good and service producing spaces, you lose all of that. You lose the history around the market. You lose, well, actually, this market, say an insurance market in the UK, serves our outward investment uh, goals. And it has done over X number of years with X amount of political set settlement within it. So it's at this point, it's at this point from the 1980s onwards that we see not just a loss of national sovereignty, not just a loss of national sovereignty, but a loss of self-determination over markets. It intensifies into the 1990s, also with a change in European competition policy, where by the old Hayekian, any economists in the room? Yeah, range of market offer, European contemporary competition policy was superseded by the Chicago School of Economics and efficiency. So you allow concentrations, you allow concentrations of power, supermarkets, you allow this earlier, you wouldn't have. Um, at this point also Germany's Landesbanken, their state-supported local investment banks were required to dispense with state guarantees by the European Commission and engaged with international finance, finance markets with fairly disastrous consequences that we'll come back to. Now, that's then. That is then. The 1980s, a process of integration as disintegration. Not necessarily a European happening, a global happening, a change in economic thought. What is going on today what is going on today? Why is Europe in chaos today? Now, I'm going to give you... Well, it is, it is, it's also, it is also simply true. You will, you will find a lot of commentators who talk about today's crisis within Europe as being Germany's crisis, that it is very much a result of um, Germany's position. Not that Germany is an evil force, but just that we have, as usual, as usual, as we've done so many times before, we've tried to deal with the German problem and we've only made it worse. Yeah? We've only made it worse. Now, the Maastricht Treaty, 1992, when Germany was forced into the Euro, out of the Denmark and into the Euro, it brought with it, well, it said, it said OK to the French and OK to to, to the Italians, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll join the Euro, but, but we still have a bit of a price for that, and that price is we must also bring with us our theory of monetary stability. And this is called ordo-liberalism, which we'll also come back to. Ordo-liberalism, 1929, the Berlin Wall, uh, 1929, the Wall Street crash, hyperinflation in Germany, post-World War II, as part of the political settlement of it must never happen again, um, the idea of 
a constitutionalized commitment to monetary stability as a means of defending always against inflation, uh, the inflation that was perceived to have aided in Germany's slide into Nazism, uh, Nazi regime, uh, that idea is brought from the German level to the European level. So the European treaties commit the European Central Bank to monetary stability. Now that's a very dry sort of exposition. You're all going, <laughs> oh, what's this, what's this constitutional exposition? No, 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 no. If you were Greek, if you were Greek on the streets of Athens, you'd be going, ah. Oh. Sovereign debt crisis, yes? Sovereign debt crisis could be solved tomorrow from a Greek perspective if only the European Central Bank would print more money will print more money. The European Central Bank cannot print more money because it is committed by the European treaties to price stability. The old German idea outside of the German context commits Europe to price stability, the Eurozone to price stability. Worse still, the German thinking of the 2000s, the sick man of Europe, the debt break, the debt break on governmental expenditure that Germany introduced for itself, is reproduced at European Union level within the mechanisms designed to overcome sovereign debt crisis. So, Greece, Greece, can receive aid from other European countries, can receive aid from other European countries, but that aid is subject to economic conditionality, i.e. Greece must engage in quite severe structural, well, must engage in structural reform, for which Reid cut its economy, cut its economy, in order to receive the cash that pays daily for its civil servants. So the <coughs> austerity regime, the austerity regime introduced by Germany in the 2000s, again reproduced very much with Germany behind it within our crisis law dealing with sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone. So we have economic conditiona conditionality, a beloved political will above political will. The whole of the Eurozone has signed up to debt breaks. All Eurozone countries have agreed to constrain government expenditure. The UK has joined in. Even the Labour Party has joined in. The idea of governmental self-restraint in financing has become the mantra there is no alternative. What does it mean, though? It means our political desire to do something different, to engage in some other form of politics, is now prevented and blocked by law, even at constitutional level in certain countries. So that is one uh, sort of idea of how this crisis is so very German. I'll just briefly mention at the end that we've also got um, a European system of financial supervision and banking union, which has also spread the idea that central banks, central banks will not only control public expenditure, they will also control private money creation in debt. So if there's too much debt in the bank, the central banks now step in to stop that. So a nightmare, a nightmare of economic, and it is a nightmare, and it has very real impacts, not just on the streets of Athens, but also here, here. We're not even part of the Eurozone, but the rhetoric has fed its way into our system, and it constrains our political choices. There is a dominant economic rationality out there that has, supersede, that has overcome all politics. Is it a German problem? 
I, oh, zutiefst undeutsch. <laughs> zutiefst undeutsch. Every time I go to Germany these days, I am horrified at how un-German Germany is. How un-German Germany has become. That process of integration as disintegration of the 1980s, I'm not sure the UK is a major victim of it. Somehow in our universal welfareist approach to um, the post-war social settlement, we managed to create quite a strong or clear distinction between this is us being social and this is the market you know, being the market. Whereas in Germany's more corporatist arrangements, those, those, there's, the distinction is blurred. The distinction is blurred. And in that sense, Germany's, the, in, the disintegrative impulses have had a greater effect on the German economy. Things like shop opening hours, the way workers were trained in apprenticeship schemes in Germany, actually very annoying things to a certain extent because it was al always felt quite restrictive. Germany always felt quite restrictive. But at the same time, an incredible stability in political or democracy within the German economy, yeah? a democracy. And that, in a certain sense, is what seems to be lost. And to come back to the Landesbanken, this should read Vestobe, um, um, this was one of the local investment banks that dealt with inward investment or supported uh, nor uh, North Rhine-Westphalia with inward investment. So especially when, say, the coal industry collapsed, they were there, seed, venture capital, very much working with the politicians to rebuild that part of Germany. Forced out onto the global markets, they were the major culprits in the Irish housing collapse. Yes? Incredibly bad behaviour. Incredibly bad behaviour. So, was the financial crisis a product of Germanness? No, probably a product of un-Germanness. Okay, so that's what Europe has done. What Europe has been doing for the last... 30 years, utterly complicit in a form of economic rationality that is, well, for me, destructive of the socially, politically, culturally embedded economy. It does have its advantages, obviously, opportunity, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Now, Gisela Stewart the three musketeers of the Brexit campaign. It's very distressing to see Gisela Stewart along with Michael Gove and Boris Johnson. But actually, Gisela Stewart's disenchantment with Europe has been coming a very long time. I met her oh, can't remember, back in the early 2000s when she was the UK parliamentary um, delegate to the European Convention that at that time was preparing a wonderful, shiny constitution for the peoples of Europe. We were going to be given this lovely, shiny constitution for the peoples of Europe. And I met her in a hotel lobby one night. She was a bit... I was maybe a bit more. But at that time, she expressed an extraordinary... Her frustration was, as a parliamentarian engaging with European Union institutions, that there wasn't going to be any democracy. But Michelle, if you won't have any democracy, we won't have any democracy. Um, so at that time, she was already quite sceptical. I, in relation to the Constitution, was quite relieved that it failed. In fact, very relieved that it failed because, I don't know, the vision of, um, it was Valérie Giscard d'Estaing and, and Giuliano, Giuliano Amato from Italy. How many times has he been Italian Prime Minister? Dottor Sottile. Lord knows what that man gets up to. But, yeah? Mm -hmm. And the sight of them in a battle bus enjoining us all to be democratic just, just left me a bit <laughs> perplexed. But, but there is a problem with 
the federalism that goes with this democratic vision of Europe is very much escape from the prisoner's dilemma. We know Europe isn't democratic. We know Europe isn't democratic. Uh, we know there's a problem. We could solve that tomorrow if we became a federal state. We really could solve it tomorrow if we became a federal state. No problem at all. But if the soul is not there, do you want to be part of a federal European state? Very few people do want to be part of a federal European state. And until that desire is there amongst the peoples of Europe, I think we have to live um, with imperfect democracy in Europe. So the failure of that didn't upset me too much. Now, um, Gisela is making a, a correct argument in a certain sense. She says that there is no place for the left within the European Union. Why is there no place for the left within the European Union? Because Europe has a bias to the right. The vast majority of governments within Europe are made up by conservative forces or by Christian democratic um, parties. The European Parliament, when it got, at last got the chance to vote for its own president, voted for Jean-Claude Juncker, so a man very much of the right, rather than Martin Schulz, who I think I've misspelt. No, I haven't put him up there. Right, okay. Um, so Gisela says, look, it's no, it's no point us from a left-wing perspective staying within Europe because Europe is always going to be a right-wing organisation. I say she is wrong. She is wrong. But not because Europe mightn't be dominated by the right, but because she has failed to understand the real depth of the crisis we are failing. Uh, we are facing now. The integration as disintegration, the domini dominant economic rationalities that are somehow creating an inevitability of the way that we are ruled by economic thinking, it's not, a it's not necessarily of the right. This is not necessarily of the right. This is a crisis in economic liberalism a crisis in the way the left and the right together view the economy and its relationship with society. And in addressing that problem, we actually have common cause with the right from the left-wing perspective. Obviously, I'm from... Well, obviously. Actually, not so obvious in what's coming, but, um, yeah. There is common cause from the left and from the right to address the problem of or the crisis in economic liberalism, and to do so within the European institutions we have. I find myself... What is this problem? I find myself agreeing with a lot of people I've never agreed with before, chairs of insurance companies, what have you. Um, what is this dominant economic rationality that we're talking about? What is its defining feature? Neoliberalism? Neoliberalism is just these days, as used today, is just a rhetorical device. It doesn't really mean much. It really, it, it is just talking about those bits of the capitalist system that none of us like. Yeah? None of us like. It doesn't really mean much. And it's not going to help us overcome the problems we've got just to screech about neoliberalism. A lot of what's been going on over the last years is not necessarily of the right. There is a massive, massive, massive regulatory structure that's come into being over the last 30 years in support, in support of um, efficiency, in support of rational market actors. We've never had so much regulation as we've got now. It's the idea of perfecting the market in line with these abstract ideas of efficient markets and rational actors that drives massive demand for compliance, a massive demand for regulatory structures, socialism but not as we understand it. This is actually a, a commentary um, from uh, an, an ordo-liberal uh, German lawyer what he's talking about is totalization, not socialism, totalization, the idea that you can control markets 
that somehow you can perfect markets. The idea that Colin Crouch has, always ta has also talked about, privatised Keynesianism. How do we make up for the denuded state when people still want welfare? We make sure that people can borrow money without end, that markets will never collapse. And that thinking still goes on post-crisis. If only we can find the right logarithms, yes, we will have a perfect market. This is a million miles away, a million miles away from Hayek's view of markets, a normative view of markets that says markets bring freedom precisely because they are uncertain. So in a certain sense, in a very <coughs> real sense, we are globally a million miles away from market value, even as the right understands it. And the only uniting factor in our globally dominant economic rationalities are their amorality, their social amorality. The way that we no longer think of a market as being part of society. Econo mm, let's go back, let's go back where neoliberalism started. Started in the 1930s as a term, Paris Conference. And it was introduced as a term in defence, not simply of markets, but also of the social constitution in which they were suspended against the forces of fascism and the forces of communism. This was about liberals, classical liberals, saying we are about to be wiped out on the one hand by the left, on the one hand by the right. We need a theory of markets that still locates them in society and which we can defend against these forces. This is actually the roots of the term neoliberalism. It becomes even clearer when it's reformulated. This is Walter Eucken, the great hero of the, the German Ordo liberals, and it's reformulated in Berlin the next year as Ordo liberalism. Walter Eucken, a personally brave man who also defended Heidelberg University against Martin Heidegger, against his attempts to Nazify the university. So these people were about fighting totalitarianisms, totalitarianisms. The market for them was always going to be a guarantee against totalitarianism precisely because it's uncertain, because it's, a, it's an order of economic opportunity for individuals to define themselves outside the totalizing thinking of totalitarian regimes. But markets, and if you read this quote, it's again Messmacher, but explaining their position, markets are not just markets to these ordo liberals. They are spheres of economic opportunity that must always, always be seen in conjunction with politics, with society. They must be constituted so that there is a moral relationship between markets <coughs> and politics and society. Now, I'm off the left and I can't but disagree with an awful lot of ordo-liberal thinking. Yeah? I can't but dis It sends me screaming into the garden sometimes when I'm reading it and round and round the apple tree, screaming, no, no. But in this, its efforts to constitute the market in a moral manner, to create a sphere of market opportunity for individuals, but at the same time to supply the state with the fruits of market activity, such that the state can fulfil its social functions, that it's actually got the ability to fulfil its social functions. In this, we have, left and right, a common moral language, and the German economy of the post-war years is not just the ordo-liberals. This is um, Ludwig Erhard, who was the ordo-liberal finance minister of post-war Germany. He fought, not simply fought and cooperated with the left, 
but also with the social Catholicism of Adenauer, the forces of tradition. And Germany's unbelievably successful post-war economy was a mixture and an accommodation between the left, the right, the radical, auto-liberals, markets, Hayek, radical forces of tradition, social Catholicism. Why fighting all the time, but also cooperation? Why cooperation? Because there is a shared language of morality. Yes, a morality that sees markets not as some <sighs> totalizing theoretical picture of perfection, but something that is sus suspended within our social world and must be related to politics and to society. And it is this language, I think, within European institutions that we share and we share and can fight for, and we can fight for globally. Now, Europe, we must think about as being in the global, yeah? The global economic state of nature. And what Europe can offer, that morality, but also the institutions in which we can assert that morality, that new vision of order, through reconnection of the market to society. This is not about sovereignty. We can't have sovereignty back. Sovereignty is long gone, long gone. <coughs> Hobbes is long dead, long dead. But this is about self-determination and self-determination over markets. Yes, we can have the opportunities of market supply, but we must also be able to assert ourselves over them. Globally, there are no institutions in which we could achieve that. The bilateral trade agreements, and I think there are something like 234, maybe a bit wrong, but 234 operating at the world, something around that figure. There's no political institution in a bilateral trade agreement. Instead, there is only the investor protection principle where people, and this is going on daily now, people are, governments are, are paying investors if their social and economic regulation inconveniences them. That is, <laughs> that, is, that is not asserting yourself over the market. Also, the World Trade Organization, at its point of judicial application, has no connection to political or social or cultural values and has to work with science. So at the global level at the moment, there simply aren't the institutions within which we can reconnect the market with society. Europe has those institutions. They're going wrong at the moment and we need to fight for them, but it at least has those institutions. Now, Norman Tebbit, bless him. <laughs> tells a really good story, actually. Um, he became disenchanted with Europe over, over, a, over a quite long period. He was um, working as an airline pilot, and he actually was involved in European committees with airline pilots from around Europe to uh, aid in the creation of norms for airline safety. And he, he, he says he loved it. He loved every minute of it. He was just absolutely bowled over. And I know exactly what he's talking about it because I've experienced it myself, is the sudden commonality of language between you and other people, regardless, regardless of where they come from, whichever nation they come from. Because you've got a shared interest. Bang. Everything suddenly so wonderful and rational and da 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 Yeah, love it, love it. But then he says, slowly but surely, as he came back to the UK and worked in, worked in politics, he noticed that that expert language didn't seem to reflect the masses. This was the technocratic European elites. You know, that joy, that joy was the European elites. And then he became suspicious. What about the common man? What about the common man? The peoples of Europe. 
the peoples of Europe. What about their voices? Now I'd say, yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right, Norman. And obviously expert communities have caused terrible damage, say financial crisis, within Europe over the past years. But, but, where you're wrong is that the common woman, the common man, their voices are increasingly being heard. They're heard in free movement. They are heard in the Europeanisation of the media, which we maybe experience less here in the UK, but certainly Germany, Italy, very Europeanised. You can, if you listen, hear the voice of the common man in Europe on the common woman in Europe. What do they want? What do they want? And so they want what we all want, and especially in this age of globalisation that is exciting but terrifying. And what do we all want in relation to that? We want the opportunity. I want the opportunity. Maybe a crusty old academic. But I understand the economic opportunity and the real, you know, the real inspirational side that you get out of that. If you're a young person stuck... Some part of me wishes I was 10 years younger that I might have been a bit more entrepreneurial. We all want that. But we all want also the security. The security. We don't want our world to be taken to pieces. We want to be able to stand still. So order and opportunity. Order and opportunity. That inherent... Yeah? How to achieve that? More order, less Europe. <laughs> For more order, we need less Europe. Order in that sense of, I can have the opportunity, but I've also got uh, the security. Less efficiency. Less efficiency. What the dominant economic rationality at the moment is doing is also undermining other views of economic value. The farmer, the farmer who is forced out of business by the efficiency of the supermarkets, uh, he has a different view of economic value. We do not, we do not, we, we must sacrifice the efficiency principle. Also, we must be quite happy to limit integration. Those bits of the nationally embedded economies that are left to us, and in the UK the prime example is the National Health Service, they're irritating, they're inefficient, but you know what the National Health Service expresses. It expresses so much more than just a way of giving health care. It is, it is a democratised institution. So less Europe, less Europe, more order, less Europe. So we fight in the institutions, overcome the crisis in political liberalism, we create more order through less Europe. That's my plan. Not that anyone's listening. <laughs> my plan for Europe. The final, though, paradoxical sting in the tail in all of this, and this is it, this is it. Europe, if we, if we commit to Europe, are we turning our backs on the rest of the world? Yeah? Are we turning out fortress Europe? If we organise and we fight in European Union institutions. Uh, what does this say, say about our relationship with the globe? And that's quite important because I think most young people would define themselves globally rather than just in the European context. And if there is one thing, yeah, there is one thing that this globally dominant economic rationality has done in a way that the left or religions have never managed to do, it is break down global patterns of non-recognition and discrimination, yes? You work, you know, welcome all. You are, I don't care where you come from or what you are, if you will fit into my economic system away, da 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 da, -da. So there is an issue there. There is a very strong issue there. But again, as in Eastern Europe, I do not feel that we can ever say that a global measure of justice is the right of someone to work for less than I do. Competitive labour advantage. That is not global justice. And my feeling is that if Europe... And it's, it's messy. This isn't a perfect solution. Uh, a new form of order 
in chaos and it will always be messy. Europe's never going to be particularly democratic. It's just not in its soul. Well, it's just not in, it, there's no immediate solution to that problem. Also, economically, you are talking about taking some economic hits if you say, right, we're going to preserve some old style institutions. It's never going to be perfect. But if in this mess it can somehow offer people opportunities within the globally frightening world but still a measure of security, then that is a template for global organisation that is worth pursuing. And I'll stop there. Questions and comments? <laughs> They don't have to be. <laughs> yeah. First of all, thank you. That is sort of a massive amount of ground you covered there. And it's quite difficult to find out. Yeah, sorry. For me, I, I mean, I would... I do, I, I do, I do support the concept of quite that point. I, I, I view things in the concept of neoliberalism, and I know a lot of people don't like that term. But for me, the process you described from the 1980s onwards is part of what neoliberalism is, combined with an ideological component that makes us think more individualistically. Um, so there's a lot of sort of socially engineered market mechanisms that aren't really markets. In yeah. Speak. You know, to make things act like they're markets when they're not really. It's not yeah. about profits. It's about, and you know, for example with schools having legal tables that makes parents compete with each other to get their children in the best school rather than think collectively about how so there's, there's that is a sort of a other side of what I would see as neoliberalism. And yeah. I, I suppose if I've got a question at any if I ha at all, it's really it feels like <coughs> this thing neoliberalism, whatever you want to call it, has reached an end point is no longer able to deliver what it promised. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, 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 and I wouldn't see the left and right as agreeing. I, I, I think the centre hasn't got solutions, and things seem to be getting more polarised between left and right. If anything, uh, I just want your thoughts. Um, do we want to gather, or do we want to? Should we gather? Because there's quite a few there. No, a quick one. I mean, uh, you talked about the globalised issue, but. There is nothing said about the Commonwealth in this European context. No. And, and Great Britain have an obligation to the Commonwealth. Yeah. And, uh, and what success and effect on the Commonwealth when we sign up to join? That's the opportunity missed by the Labour government, I think. Yeah. Given that? Mine is a genuine question. Could we elaborate with the less privileged woman? What do does in practical terms mean that we have more order and less efficiency? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, can I say, I take, I mean the paradox is just so painfully apparent to me, it always, and I'm not, it's not going to go away. There, there is something, there is something really rather unfortunate about the club, the club yeah. Now, my one point, though, would be that, that to deny clubs is our way to perdition. I mean, I, I, we, need, we need a degree of organisation. We need a degree of organisation to actually, you know, control or, or, or re-establish self-determination in the face of the oh. universal process of globalization hopefully long term yeah hopefully long term the clubs open as well i mean there, there are those that argue for bipolar worlds i'm not a, a multipolar worlds of organization i i would hope that that will only ever be a stepping stone and that's that's about the best i can do but i see your, i see the paradox bang i see the paradox now pragmatically order order in chaos it's its starting point is exactly this starting point. It's, yes, you said there is polarisation. I want to end the polarisation in relation to the primary point that we re-establish moral 
authority over markets. And I think the left and the right, traditional right, Christian democratic right, socially Catholic right, they have that as the left has it. Now, there are points of conflict. There are going to be massive points of conflict. If you're talking about not, in that quote about the order lo liberals, not rendering the political po uh, potency of the economic to um, uh, uh, the political realm, that's <coughs> saying to socialist governments, no, you shall not just nationalise everything. So there's always going to be a point of friction there, but that essential... For me, a rebirth of the left and the right together, the recognition of a moral relationship with markets that's politically and socially constructed. Pragmatically, what does that more order mean? It means, yes, I can guarantee you certain rights of cross-border market opportunity. You can go to France and you can set up a business and you can do this, that and the other. What you cannot do, or what I would prefer you not to do, is undermine an embedded national market. So, not say in relation to the National Health Service, so that French providers, yeah, French providers would not be allowed to come here and set up a hospital according to the French social insurance principle that brings the National Health Service down. Yeah? That's the pragmatic side of what I'm saying. And we are at that point, health policy, where the National Health Service could be under threat. And that's, that's my less Europe. Stop. Stop. Pragmatically, I want you to have opportunity, but not where you destroy self-determination over markets. First of all, thank you for a superb presentation. Thank you. My question. I come from the passionate Remainer corner. I had the opportunity last week to put a question to Gordon Brown at the LSE, yep. which was why the Remain campaign is not actually majoring on what we could, as an influential member yes. of the European community, do to bring about a, a counterbalance to the, def to the democratic deficit. I didn't really get an answer from Brown. I wonder whether you would got an answer. <laughs> <laughs> as I stated, the easy solution, the easy solution how we escape out of this prisoner's dilemma of the democratic deficit would be a federalization. Would be a federalization. Would that, that be so terrible? I don't think the peoples of Europe want it yet. I really don't. This is not the age of Bismarck. It's not the age of Garibaldi. You can't, I mean, how were our federations of the 1860s, 1870s made? They were made in violence, and they were made in authoritarian repression. Yeah? You can't do that now. You've got to have the soul. You know, um, Wolfgang in Wuppertal. <laughs> He's got a vote. He's got a vote, yeah? And he's... Well, he doesn't. Well, leave him. Well, no, no, no. He does, obviously. He does, obviously. He really does, obviously. And he obviously believes in certain things. And I'm not going to dismiss him at all. People, you know, people... This is a democratic period of mass media and you can't force a federation. It's got to be of the soul. And I don't think people are ready for that federal solution. In the meantime, in the meantime, um, for me, it's always going to be messy, but at least a self-determination over the economy is already a step back to having more of a political voice. But it is going to be messy. I can't give you a programme where I could run forward and say... Da -da -da -da. On a daily basis, I deal with accountability in European institutions, which, which people can present their views to which institution. And maybe in new governance structures, we have um, a new form of corporatism. Maybe. But it's messy. It's not inspirational. I mean, corporatism isn't inspirational, is it? I mean, if you think about it, uh, yeah, uh, the Scandinavian countries as well, meeting people in back rooms with beer and sandwiches. It's hardly the democratic... But that's the core of their 
constitutional democracy. Best I can do. Sorry. Further crisis. And what crisis? Well, <coughs> it's going to have to be something positive, isn't it? It's not not a crisis. The crisis we have at the moment is giving us more Europe, but it's more Europe of the fiscal compact, of the European trimester, of the European Commission checking national budgets of the German Parliament checking the Irish budget before the Irish see it. Now this is not, you know, this is more Europe but not a more democratic Europe. I think uh, my instinct would be younger generations are simply different. They, they, are, they are moving more than anyone's ever moved before and it will be from that, that pool that we will have maybe a European feeling that gives the European Federation more, I can't, I can't really see. It is the same generation that doesn't show much interest in the upcoming referendum. Well, they did, didn't they? Didn't they try and register en masse and crash the system? <laughs> they may be a bit late, but when was a young person on time? <laughs> huh? <coughs> yeah, maybe it's back. I'd just like to suggest that European Union <coughs> has proved itself to be a vehicle for self-determination. On the contrary, it's overridden self-determination. Yeah. It's more, particularly Greece and Ireland, as we just mentioned. So it's actually a metaphor imposing the rule of corporate and banks and of quote-unquote markets over the rights of peoples. So I think it's yeah. an outdated institution and it's changed its function massively over the last 50 years, and we, sh we should be looking for something much better than that. There is absolutely no denying what you've just said. Yeah? It's gone horribly, horribly, horribly wrong. But for me, the impetus, the reason why it went horribly, horribly wrong was not, it wasn't Horst Krenzler and those founding generation of Eurocrats, quite the contrary. And, and in the 1980s, that generation was very much a bulwark against the European descent into uh, the form of dominant economic thinking that, that has Greece on its knees now. This was a national movement of the mind which colonised European integration logics. You say we need something new. I say we've got the institutions, let's remake them rather than you know, where, how are we going to make anything new at the moment? How are we going to make anything new? We've got the existing institutions. Let's fight for them first. Yep, yeah, lady there. Yep. Um, to start with the point um, that you said earlier that the change in Europe might be positive, I'm not sure that I share that optimism. optimism. give you a guarantee that the sort of fight I propose for the European institutions will work. Can't give you a guarantee at all. Nor in 1945 could the founders of the German Republic, and that specifically that Ordo, the Earhart's in it, give a guarantee that the structures they were creating with an eye to preventing fascism 
ever come coming together. Could they couldn't have given you a guarantee in 19 well it's 48 uh, that the German Republic would ever succeed, but it did succeed, and that was one of the worst you know the worst oh, yeah the worst sort of instances in history that we've had. So it can succeed. Um, what more can I say? What more can I say? If we were to leave, would it, would it speed up the pace of change? It, it would create some extraordinary earthquakes. Extraordinary earthquakes. You, UK breakup, I think that's an inevitability if we leave. Then you get the Spanish breakup. You get regionalism breaking up. I would see it more being a totally centrifugal force than creating something wonderful and new in Europe if we go. Where or how does TTIP fit into your own? TTIP. TTIP, yeah? One of the bilateral trade agreements, and do remember there are hundreds of them already at work. Yeah? It's the first one, it's the first time that a bilateral trade agreement is being challenged on the investor protection principle because we have institutions, we have the European Parliament that said we're not going there to the investor protection principle and you've got the member states beginning to line up behind the European Parliament. So TTIP is not a, ple a pleasant thing in terms of a dominant Chicago School of Economics driving it, but for the first time ever, and only the European Union has been able to achieve this, we see a break on the thinking in uh, the bilateral trade agreements. So it would support my argument that using the institutions we have is the best way, is the best way to stop even more, even more destruction of our, um, um, well, of our self-determination, of our moral economic orders as the European institutions. Although the Commission's been disgraceful in trying to keep everything secret. I mean, it shows the worst of Europe as well, the whole TTIP saga. Um, sorry, um, I, may, I know I may be biased because I'm Spanish, I'm from Spain, I don't look like it, and I don't sound like it either. But the thing is that there's also a problem that there's 3 million UK people in Spain at the moment. And we don't see, and we're really not complaining about the, those people. We're not complaining at all, and yeah, we, in the UK, we have people blaming us, the immigrants, for everything that's wrong with the UK. We're blaming for the problem with the NHS when we aren't. I'm not, like, coping any. I'm paying my taxes. I'm working here. <laughs> I don't even have a loan because I don't want to take any privileges from other English people. So why should I assume the blame? Why should I be accused of something I'm not doing? Why should I be accused when I'm here legally and I have worked all my life to be in a university here? I don't understand. A Cu couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Rome and we were, we were stuck in the, the eternal traffic jam. Yeah. Eternal city. Eternal city, eternal traffic jam. An Italian friend of mine told me a story um, in the 1970s. Um, uh, their parents had come to London for the sabbatical academics, baguette academics, had come to London for the sabbatical year. And he, was, he, was, he was primary school age and they were, they were sort of optimistically had taken him with them and just dumped him in a primary school in Richmond. Yeah? So he arrives in Richmond in the primary school. He doesn't have any cultural knowledge and he also doesn't speak a word of English. And the school the school gave him a little playmate to look after, you know, to look after him and to translate. A girl who was um, a British Italian in origin. Yeah? And there was one problem in that arrangement, was the little girl had hidden the fact that she was half Italian from all her playmates. She'd banned, she'd banned, she'd banned her mother from picking her up at the school gates so that no one knew she was Italian. And obviously she was mortified. My friend just embarrassed beyond belief. And when he told me that story, that I, felt, I actually felt physical pain because I experienced much the same in the 1970s with a German mother in Chinkford. Although I reacted in the other way, I just shoved my Germanness down people's throats. <laughs> but the 1970s xenophobia was... <sighs> horrible. It was horrible and it 
I mean, I, I, it was culturally stagnating. Do people remember the um, um, Sunday afternoons and the war films, Every, the, the repeats? I, I remember sat in front of the telly begging, I think it was Reach for the Sky, begging the German Luftwaffe commandant not to give Douglas Bader his legs back. So I just could not take it anymore. The cultural enclosure that you get from that form of xenophobia is appalling and it was a blight on British society and it is wonderful, it is wonderful living in London now, uh, not just, actually not just anti-European but anti-everything, that it's not perfect, it's a hell of a lot better though than it ever was and this city is infinitely better for it. The unleashing Yes, the unleashing of some of that old stuff. Yes, of course you can be worried about um, well, pressure I mean, on... So you can be that. worried about pressure on... I have been experiencing that. Yeah. I have, been, I have seen people yeah. throw, throw it me, is insulting me because I'm in Spanish and I have been accused of... Well, it's disgusting. Coping stress because I'm not doing anything. It is disgusting and tell them to get lost. It is legitimate for people to worry about pressure on social resources. It is legitimate for people to complain, to complain if their wages are depressed, yes? If their wages are depressed because European Union uh, sets itself up in, a, in asks Eastern Europe to compete itself to parity with the full knowledge that they're going to undermine Western European um, or, or even, you know, even the developing social systems in Eastern Europe, that that's going to be undermined by this form of market. That's legitimate. Xenophobia is not, and it's terrible. You were talking about xenophobia, and I was subjected to that because I have Greek parents. Um, Do you recognize the Douglas Bader problem? I, I, I understand <laughs> what you're saying. No, I, you know, it wasn't the problem for me per se, but um, part of the problem is that you know, at school, I was picked on my dad was discriminated on, but the xenophobia were, was generally amongst the common people. Now the xenophobia is coming from politicians who are supposed to be leading us, and that's why it's a more serious problem now than it was back then, in some respect. Possibly. I, I, um, I think the Labour part of the Labour government in the 1970s was quite... I, no, they were paternalistic. I think that there is yeah. a bit of a there's a bit of a problem that that you know Uncle Uncle Harold and his immigration acts, which were um, pretty hard hitting <laughs> and restricting immigration, but it was it was we believed in them. We don't believe in politicians in a paternalistic way anymore. Well, well, I was really ignorant to work 25 years in the National Council. Yeah. And uh, you talk about effic efficiency there. Yeah. Why economy? So, yeah. Why are you talking about economics? There are other things to talk about. I talk about economics because I think our major global problem is, is the fact that we've divorced markets and economics from society. It's of course there are other things. But for me, that's exactly the problem, that the process of globalisation has come in an economic sphere that has taken the economy out of the social, yeah, out of the social construct. Now, in a certain sense, in a certain sense, you know, um, um, talking about other things without relating them to the economy, saying we've got cultural integration, we've got, you know, we've got great music that we all share in common, for me is also part of the problem. Now, I want, I want people talking about the economy in its social context. Because that, to me, is the core problem. That is the problem that's, that's, that's creating the tensions, that's creating, that, 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 that has destroyed, you know, that has destroyed an original vision of Europe and an original vision of beyond Europe even, yes? That's why I do it. That's why I do it. So the front and then the back. Did you? Yeah. Uh, I have uh, two points. Uh, one of them is that uh, this, the drop in salary is also may, might it also be due to the influence that uh, most of the uh, industry 
where there were higher paid salaries, they moved to China. And so the, the level of work available nowadays are of a lower grade. And so we can't blame only Europe. It is a worldwide Yes, it's worldwide. I agree with you. I agree with that you. That is happening in many countries where the industry was shifted to other parts and the type or kind of labor uh, offered to the uh, citizens of that country are of a lower grade. And also, I don't believe that uh, uh, this problem of immigration as it was today on in the uh, television saying that by in 20 years the number is going to be sky high. Because today England may be an attraction. Yes, it won't be 20 years down. But that doesn't mean that it will remain forever. No, you're absolutely right. To other countries that are undeveloped, they have the opportunity to develop and to retain their citizens. No, you have, you're absolutely right on both points. I mean, in, in, this is such an exciting world. This is yes. such an exciting world. I can go all sorts of places, well, if I were a bit younger and a bit more entrepreneurially minded, and create my business. But at the same time, it is terrifying because, because where I'm working could move tomorrow. Yeah? The global world is exciting and terrifying. And I want some form of control over it that does not close down opportunities, but for the people who are really hit by the terrifying side of it, that they have some form of, they have some Europe. form of, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. And I, I, it, for me, this isn't a European. That core crisis is not a European crisis. It's a crisis of globalization linked with the economic rationalities that we have, yes? To a certain degree, uh, it's a difficult one because would we have globalization without those economic rationalities? But yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Ladies, back. Yeah, I wanted to say, I've got two questions. That Asian gentleman is still there. I'd like to say to you, um, you've been talking about the There's still a lack of change with language. My parents came to this country to work my mother worked in the NHS for 40 years. My father worked at the BBC. They were never called immigrants. They were asked to come here to do jobs that were low paid, that they couldn't get enough people to do. And they were told they were part of the colonies and part of the empire, and they were welcome here. They knew more about this country than a lot of the people that yeah. who came from this country. Do not call yourself. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, that's the reason I put that name, and that's the reason I mentioned about Kumambel before. Yeah. Because uh, that is the discussion I want to talk about. Yeah, and that's, 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 you're right, and there's the paradox. There is the paradox. Do you do become. It's not just in Europe, it's global. Where my parents come from, there are mass migrations of people coming through, going to different countries. It's a global thing. Whether people think it's fair or not, it's something that's happening and people need to open up to deal with it <laughs> and try and deal with it in some kind of real, rational, positive way. There are a lot of people who are fleeing from war-torn countries. I watched a project of an African man. He was in Italy, in the mountains. He didn't want to be there. <coughs> he was out there because he had to flee for his life. He thought he'd only be there for three days. Yeah. He was waiting for someone to pick him up, to take him back. <laughs> and he can't go back because there's civil unrest. So there is a mass migration going on, and it means that you have to make a new dialogue. And if you make a new dialogue, yeah. you have to make new policies, and people have to interact in different ways. A vision, a vision that deals with the reality, which is. That's absolutely right. Yeah, you don't say we're gonna. How do we stop? How do we stop it? It's it's there. You're right, and a vision that deals constructively with the reality. Yeah. Yeah. Two more formal points, and then we'll move across. So the gentleman there and the lady here. Would you like to say just a very brief word about the part that law has played? Uh, <coughs> in economics, particularly, I'm thinking of 
uh, restrictions on free collective bargaining, uh, rules limiting the activities of trade unions, not just in the UK but elsewhere. Yeah, the law has played a, a, a really upsetting role um, within Europe. Um, the first, the integration through law movement, uh, uh, that, that, you know, there is no political uh, consensus, no problem, we'll take it forward through law. Then the law becomes part of the economic, law is economic rationality. Now, European law is economic rationality, the case of Thomas Pringle where they substitute e economic reasoning for legal reasoning. Law has played a truly dreadful role uh, in this. However, again, the Aldo Liberals... <laughs> so, I'm going to show you and your Aldo Liberals. <laughs> yeah, you're Aldo Liberals. Uh, not just economists, they were lawyers as well. Franz Boom, yeah? Uh, and the law can play such a constructive role where it becomes part of... Law remembers what it's about. It's about not about running society, but about constituting society. And that is something we as lawyers need, get, need to get back to rapidly, ASAP, ASAP. Um, one situation I find very disconcerting about all this um, EU debate is that on both uh, Brexit and Remain, they are all being extremely disloyal and giving misinformation. Oh, they are uh, such... Yesterday, I was with the <laughs> Council of Ministers and asked them, how come all the churches um, are back in Remain? Yeah. And what did I get? Oh, do you not realize that the churches are depleted? So with the influx of the Europeans, churches are filling up again. So it's only... <laughs> <laughs> Father O'Reilly, I need me, I need my Polish altar boy. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to be doing for the altar boys? <laughs> and another thing was, oh, we, we are having a growing population and therefore we're going to need carers. Oh. So, so actually you're not really thinking much about the people that are coming in but for how you can exploit them. For your own Do you know head. that? Yeah, that, that's one that the um, um, that that's the flip side of the German openness, isn't it? It's the oh, thank goodness, with our aging population, we've at last got some new blood. No, this is not the way to look at the world. This is no. I have to agree with you. Yeah. But, have to agree uh, with yeah. you. And the other point of it to me is that um, all the colonized countries that made this country great, that Britain went over and. Pilfered and stole and um, this, yeah. destroyed for them to be great are excluded from all these discussions because these are the nations that now have to have visa to come in here. This is for me because it's not just Britain, is it? It's France. It's 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 Spain, and this for me is the core problem. For me too, the paradox of me coming down uh, for Europe, yeah, is, well, are we just repeating? Are we just repeating, you know, enclosure? We're repeating, or, or, or we're sealing uh, the e in economic inequalities that we created as colonial nations. In Europe, there is a real problem about that. Um, is that debate is not had, and why is it not had? Because there is one moral failing within Europe that seems to, and we all, evil Germans, this is about evil Germans and never again the evil German. And that whole Western seaboard, the colonial history, is never looked at as a, as a European moral problem. So, so in Germany, oh, quite honestly, let's talk about this, the flip side of me begging them not to give Douglas Bader his legs back. An average TV viewing evening in Germany, it's switching on the telly and tending to go to the arts end, because I'm obviously a bit artistic, and say, oh God, not another documentary on the Nazis. By that token, here, when do we have documentaries about colonial past? When does France have documentaries about its colonial past? When does Spain have documentaries oh. about its colonial past? Actually, we have quite a lot. Maybe this... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Spain is <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and actually, we're, we're really, really blaming ourselves all the other time. We're constantly being guilty of everything. Good.
good. You? Good. We? Good. But let, let, good. Well, we should learn from you and your guilt. We should get this, we should get this back on the table. Exactly, exactly. I, as I say, my, my, I still come down and say, look, um, the model of global efficiency, which to a certain extent addresses that problem better than anyone's ever done before, in that it at least recognises that there are countries out there. But for me, it's still a destructive model in that it lets build on the inequalities. So I don't want to go there, but we do have to find an answer to this. And step one would be that we elevate the colonial crime to the level of the, the, the World War II climb, that it's in, at least in our heads and we engage with it. I can't give you a better I can't give you a better answer than that. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to have to formally wind up here. We, we'll go across to 415 for drinks. And, sure and we'll talk sure about football <laughs> then. No, from now on in, I'm talking about football. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you very much. Thank the audience.